Okay, um, I'd like to call this work session of the Silver Falls School Board to order. And please note attendance, Denise. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's good to see so many faces here. Um, just a kind of a point of a little bit of clarification or whatever tonight. This is, a, this is a work session. It's for the board to discuss some different ideas that we talked about at our last meeting. So there won't be any public comment tonight. But if there's things that come up in your mind, keep them in your mind and come to our regular session next Monday night. Because there's always, always plenty of time for um, public comment there. So I just wanted to, to say that from the start just so there's no confusion. So, um, First off on discussion items, Eugene Field relocation options for discussion. Um, Bob and Zach, you guys want to come to the table and Andy's going to give us a little preview and get started with it. Yeah, and actually for the benefit of the audience, the, uh, the, the item 2A is uh, Eugene Field School relocation options. There's actually two pieces to this. Uh, the first one is coming largely from, from Bob. Uh, at your March uh, 17th meeting, you had asked for additional information re re uh, related to a proposal that you had received from Gene Pfeiffer, uh, a member of our community. Uh, thank you. Uh, you had... You had asked uh, for... Uh, input, uh, excuse me, for uh, uh, us to review the proposal submitted by Gene Pfeiffer, uh, mem uh, community member of Silver Falls School District. Uh, and uh, it takes some specialized work in order to do so. Uh, so we've uh, uh, secured the services of Bob Collin Collins at ACPM to uh, take a look at that work, and he's put together a, a document titled Comments on Remediation Budget Outline Recommendation. Uh, once Bob is finished uh, uh, with this portion, then uh, Tim, if you could, I'd like you to turn it back over to me uh, because I'd like to set the stage for your second request from the March 17th meeting and that's consideration of the Schlater campus for options as a middle school. I'll set that stage with some related information then it asks that or suggests that you turn it back over to Bob and to, to Zach for that conversation. Okay. okay. <clears throat> that's good Bob. Okay. Can you hear me? I'm good. Well I'm pleased to be here tonight and hope that I can offer some comments and thoughts for you to consider on the challenging issues you have as far as facilities for so far the school board. So um, you have in front of you a uh, document that's called Comments on Remediation Budget Outline Recommendation. So uh, Andy asked me to take a look at the budget document that uh, Mr. Pfeiffer offered to the board um, as an option on how to be able to renovate the Union Field School for a dollar amount that is considerably less than what had been offered before by others. So I took a look at that, and I believe that there are some significant areas of that budget that are either underpriced or missing items, and I'd like to kind of go through that. The order in which the, the topics are in are not necessarily in order of importance, but just sort of how I decided to put them here. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the seismic upgrades, because that's a pretty significant part of anything that would happen in that building whether um, you know, it's done to the full degree that ZCS talked about or as something that um, uh, the budget that uh, Mr. Pfeiffer's budget talked about. Now, I had a conversation with uh, Mr. James Shees of Dolphy Construction because I know that he helped uh, Mr. Pfeiffer with putting together the budget that was offered to you. And in that conversation, I think I understood, and I, I do want to be clear that the budget document didn't have a lot of scope, so there's some assumptions that had to be made on exactly what it was that was, you know, was being um, priced out in that document. And talking with Mr. Cheese, uh, what I understood that their thought was on what had to be done with seismic upgrade was to put two steel portal frames, which is a pretty typical way of handling some seismic issues in a building, on either side of the front door, and some portal frames at the, at the gymnasium. Okay, uh, and that was that was priced at a certain dollar amount that in, was in this budget, um, and I felt that that was worthy of my attention to uh, go understand the document that uh, ZCS provided that actually talked about a much more uh, comprehensive approach to seismic upgrades. So what I'd like to do is kind of turn it over to Zach for a few minutes, so he can explain to you again sort of what he talked about. Uh, which will help frame further comments I have about the impact that the seismic upgrades I think that need to happen in that building should you actually move forward with doing something in that building. So I'd like to turn over that for a few minutes. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, 
After uh, talking with Bob, I actually directed him to a couple documents that we put together in the evaluation of the elementary school report that the board has copies of. Um, at the very end of that report, we put together a couple drawings that are schematic in nature, but convey our understanding of the required seismic retrofits or to bring the building up to a, a life safety uh, level, which is outlined further in the ASC 31, which is what we, the evaluation process that we use that's allowed through the state. Uh, our methodology was to come in throughout the building in each principal direction and install heavy concrete or CMU uh, shear walls essentially that we could grab onto the existing building and utilize those rather than the existing brick system to resist the lateral forces that are induced during an earthquake. In addition to that, we have diaphragm strengthening, footing retrofit, and other seismic improvements out of plane connections throughout the entire building um, that go well beyond the scope of a couple portal frames in the gymnasium and surrounding the front door. Um, if any of you would like to talk about that in additional detail, I'd be happy to, uh, but I would direct you to the drawings that we prepared that are enclosed within the, the report. Can you give some compare uh, and contrast the the, um, the two methodologies, the proposed uh, portal frames versus what you, you what you got here? I mean, what are the shortcomings of portal framing? Why go the extra um, to the extra steps that are in your recommendation? My understand, and I, I haven't seen the proposed budget, but and I haven't had any conversations outside of conversations with Bob. Uh, but my understanding is the, the portal frames were specifically located in several locations. Our approach is to strengthen the entire building so that in the event of an earthquake, it's not just the front portion of the building and the gymnasium that um, don't have issues. It's the entire building so that everybody can get out safely. Um, portal frames, structural steel, uh, moment resisting frames can be utilized for this type of work. Typically we find those to be pretty expensive. Uh, they have to be detailed. More detailed than usual because they would be holding up brick rather than light timber or steel. And those types of frames can become very costly in the fabrication and installation. Uh, and they're also, they can also be difficult to put into an existing facility, whereas with CMU uh, concrete blocks, you can go in and install them a block at a time in an existing room. And it's intrusive, but it, it can be less intrusive. Uh, you're not dealing with gigantic numbers that you have to put in, trying to find ways to get them in, you're dealing with one block at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Um, just to further clarify that a little bit, again, one of the things that I believe is a challenge in the exercise I was doing was that um, there wasn't, there isn't a specific scope that was defined in Mr. Pfeiffer's budget in exactly what he's proposing, but the dollars that I understood that I think that was assigned to that kind of work was 270000 The budget amount that was in the ZCS report was somewhere around $3.8 million. So it's a big difference there. Obviously, there's a big difference in scope. I can't tell you exactly what you know what all the differences are, but I do know that that's a pretty glaring discrepancy. So, and again, it was a conversation I had with Mr. Chilies with uh, Dalkey Construction. So, following up on what I think is that big difference in scope is that in performing the work that Zach referred to, you have to do a lot of demolition work to be able to actually you know, put foundations and footers and, and block walls, which means you're gonna be affecting many areas of school, so many of the finishes are gonna to have to be changed, uh, re replaced, uh, repaired, you know, depending on the scope of that. And I think that um, the budget dollars are in the remediation budget did take that into account because it wasn't considering that amount of work. And so I think that was a, a, another large discrepancy in, in what uh, we've come up with as far as 
possible budget of dollars to you know remediate Eugene Field compared to that offered budget. So, are there any questions about that topic before I, I want to move on? Okay. In that remediation budget, there were, and I and I think you all seen that there's probably five or six pages. It was broken out pretty extensively, a lot of uh, scope items. And in there, there were a number of items that were assigned to cost by owner. Okay, um, so while that document may be a construction uh, budget, um, it's not a project budget just by that nature. And that's something the district actually has to consider. It's not just what it may cost for a contractor to come and do work. It's everything that's going to be required to get that school up to, run, up to running condition. And I kind of wanted to go over what I saw were things that were not included in that document um, that would be in, in a standard budget. Builders risk insurance is something typically that's held by the owner. Sometimes a contractor would carry it, but either way it's going to come up as a, as a cost of the project. And that's, that's not something that was included in that budget. Site lighting, there's certainly going to be some changes that happen. There wasn't anything allocated for that. There was uh, an item there for storm sewer improvements on and off site, but it said by owner or not in contract. And again, that's something that we know there's going to be an issue. There's broken pipes around the building. There's lots of issues with water. So again, that would be a project cost. Um, there was some small amount of uh, money allocated for computer wiring, computer communication systems, but not nearly enough for the level of, of uh, IT infrastructure that we need to have in the school that's going to be utilized for the next 50 years. Um, there was a, a budget line item to replace the car door with 45 minute uh, doors, which is a good thing, except that part of that also is replacing the door frames. The door frames also have to be rated to be, you know, to be up to fire code in the corridor, and there's no uh, dollars allocated for that. Um, the, in a project like that, you're going to have to have fire separation walls in certain aspects of the building. There are certain zones that the, the uh, building department is going to want to have separated off. And there was a line item for that, but it was indicated that it was covered under the fire sprinkler system. So while the fire sprinkler system had money allocated for it and it was a, uh, a reasonable amount, it's not part of, it's not the same as doing fire separation walls, which is a completely separate work task. And so there wasn't any dollars in there for that. If the school would be utilized, um, certainly the playground uh, surfaces, the covered play area, which is covered in uh, the seismic report needs some work done, um, and, and roofing needs to be replaced, uh, as well as um, the blacktop, and there was no dollars in there for that as well. So I think that that was another large item that wasn't included in the budget. Um, the next item, uh, soft cost or development costs. Um, what was included in there, again, there was, there was design fees that were broken up a number of different line items. But what they worked out to be was about 5.5% of the construction cost. Um, pretty standard for uh, architectural and design fees, about 9%. <clears throat> so that's kind of uh, a real light on that. But if the construction budget is higher than the 3.5 million or whatever the original budget there, then obviously that's going to raise up by, you know, percentage is going to change that. And in that project of this nature, um, typically, you'd have some kind of project management, owner's rep services, something to help the district out. And there wasn't any budget in there for that. Um, looking at all the items, I took a, some of the, uh, um, a glance at some of the larger ticket items, typically in a, a project of this size, and I uh, want to compare square footage cost for what I understood Eugene Field to be. I got the blueprints out and took a look at square footage of the carpet and roofing and all that stuff. And some of the areas that I saw that I thought were very deficient, very, uh, not nearly enough money for, for work, um, were cabinets. It was, I think there was something, some in the area of $4,000 for cabinets. That's obviously, and I would think there'd be a lot more money needed for that. Uh, roofing I saw is uh, quite a big difference than um, what was in that remediation budget. Uh, interior doors. Um, interior windows and finishes, there was money in, the, in there for that in the remediation budget, but it was about $100,000 less than, than the budget actually that was developed by uh, BLRB in conjunction with CCS and a document that you received. Um, and carpet 
was uh, also um, pretty uh, low amount compared to what I saw. I picked out a carpet again. I don't have a specification. I picked out a carpet I know is used in a school of similar nature and priced it out. And it was uh, probably about uh, half the amount of money was in the remediation budget. Uh, plumbing and HVAC were probably about half of what was developed by BLRB in their work. Um, so that's you know that, that was also two big items that were uh, the numbers were kind of small. Um, Division 11 in the document that uh, Mr. Pfeiffer provided um, titled equipment and in there the, the amount is ten thousand dollars and I didn't understand what that was. I knew there had to be work that had to be done to model the kitchen of some nature. So I, I, I in that same conversation with Mr. Sheaves with Dalkey Construction. Uh, I understood that there actually was conversation between those two that actually <coughs> to accomplish that would be to build a new building on the north side of the lot, about a 5,000 square foot building for 1.5 million was the estimate. So um, while that may be a good plan, that's not included in that budget and that would be a project cost to the overall remediation of that school. So that wasn't included in the document. Um, during my work on this uh, review, I had some conversations with uh, with Gerald uh, and the city, and you know we, we talked about different options. If, if we were to build a, a kitchen facility there, and what that would mean as far as parking or impact accessing from uh, from uh, First Street or Front Street, and the, the the budget doesn't actually address what might be uh, costs associated with that work. You know whether it's going to be work that's going to be required by the county by by ODOT. And so uh, that doesn't reflect any project costs that are going to be there. Again, that's outside of you know, remodeling the building, but certainly something that's part of the project. Um, uh, and it, it doesn't take into account, I know the big concerns that you and the board have had about the fact that the site is not really suitable for an elementary school right now. It's got two highways on either side of it. There's pollution, there's cars drive by, there's not a green space. So it doesn't allow for expansion and how you improve that situation. Um, uh, nor does it take into account expansion for full day kindergarten, special ed, or uh, future enrollment increases. So I think the school's pretty maxed out now. That's something that has to be taken into account when we remodel the school. Um, so in conclusion, I think that it's in my mind, it was pretty clear that the assumed scope of improvements that were covered by this remediation uh, budget do not align with what the school board would like to see if they were to actually consider remodeling that school. There would be a lot of deficiencies in moving forward with a school that services 600 students over the next 50 years. So that concludes my comments on, on that. If you have any questions? No questions for both. Or just general discussion? <coughs> Bob, you <coughs> did you come up with any figures on because I think that the Mr. Pfeiffer's budget was for around four million or what or something like that. But did you come up with any figures given the things that you talked about, how much that would increase? Eight yeah. million ten the double or eight million ten million or what? Yeah, actually I kind of uh, wrote wrote down and rolled up the document. What I saw here was that his budget was $4.1 million. I, I know there's been some changes to that. I, there was, in this dimensions here, there may be less than that based on some needs that were assumed. And what I came up with was about $9 million. You know, trying to compare apples to apples, which I couldn't quite do because I don't have a, there's not blueprints that we're both looking at. But just understanding uh, what the school, how big the school is and what needs to be done in there, that's what my thoughts were um, for what would work. And I think there's probably some items that were not necessarily accounted for. Uh, again, but I, what I did is I took his document and just tried to, you know, compare in what I thought would be square foot costs for the same amount yeah. of carpet roofing or whatever. Yeah. Nine million is a fairly hefty price tag to still have an old school that's not real functional for today's education. In my mind, that's just my opinion. So it still didn't seem to address too heavily about the plumbing either, and that seems to be a huge issue at this school. And I don't know, you said it, you said now something like half the cost, because they're not even, I mean, there's 500 kids and they should be able to flush toilets on a regular basis. Yeah, so we looked at that. So 
there are severe pressure issues, from my understanding. Um, the amount in here, um, there was plumbing, was $10,000 for two new handicapped restrooms, $50,000 allowance for plumbing fixtures to remediate existing, is how it was stated in that. Um, the, um, the amount that was included in the BLRB budget for that work, and again, that was sort of a general broad stroke, was, was uh, $540,000 for the plumbing fixtures. And again, so that's, uh, it, you know, it, it's not going off design documents, but some general costs for a school of that size and replacing the fixtures and the plumbing. All the plumbing is galvanized. I know the conversation I had um, with uh, Mr. Shees with, with Dalkey was the idea was to salvage and use some of the galvanized piping. Well, in 50 years, that piping is probably not going to be any good at all. So there's no, re there's no way it should be all replaced, in my mind. Well, and a lot, there's a major issue around pressure, and that has to do with that galvanized piping also. That's right. right. The, the opening of the closed. Yeah, you assume it's, it's just closed up. Yeah. Right. yeah, I'm sure it is after <clears throat> 90 years. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Other questions for Bob? Was there any was there any indications in um, in um, um, talking to Mr. Sykes about what what the general condition of the building was? Did he did he find any major indications of dry rot, dry rot, foundational problems, any any structural any, any indication that when when you get in there and start opening walls for for things you, that you're going to go oh my gosh to much more here than we you know was he able to say boy this whole building's in really good shape or is it in really bad shape or somewhere in the middle? Did he have any indication of that? No, we didn't get down to go down that road of talking yeah. about that. One thing, though, that I, I, I failed to mention, talking about seismic, was um, in the ZCS report, it talks about the gymnasium is not worth salvaging. It should be torn down completely. And, and that's a big difference why, you know, why the, the, uh, the budget, the remediation budget was a big difference because the idea was to remediate some of the structural timbers and put some portal frames. That's a large difference in price. Um, I know there are some big issues in there with how the attachments are. So while it may not be an issue with t a timber or trusses failing, they're just sitting up there yeah. and it wouldn't take much for them to be an issue in any kind of a seismic event. So we didn't have a conversation specific to dry rot or you know failing conditions like that. Yeah, yeah. We did talk about you know the site plumbing <clears throat> around the building a little bit because he, he did comment on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've just been you know curious about this and thinking you know there's all these unknowns if you really get into Eugene Field. Yes. And I've wondered that geez are we going to run into a bunch of these unknowns at, at Schlater? And I don't know how well they're accounted for in here. You know that's those additions are. 50 years old? Is that is, is that plumbing okay? You know that you know you know those type of things. Are we going to get into a bunch of the, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, look at this? You know we didn't know, and there goes your costs. You know we're, are, are we making some us are we making some mistaken assumptions? And, and granted, you don't have that information, but I just wonder that you know Eugene feels really old, but those additions, those additions on Schlater are pretty old too. And so, I mean, I don't want us to assume that they're just uh, plug and play, they're ready to go. I think they're going to take a lot of work. So. What were Jim's thoughts about the gym when we looked at it? I did have a conversation with him about the gym. I mean, he, t he just told me that the, the anticipated work was going to be putting some portal frames <laughs> in a couple of locations in the gym. And um, one of the things that came out of the conversation was that he felt that the scope of work that he understood was different than possibly the school district felt needed to be done. And he realized that there was a disconnect there. Yeah. But the scope he was presented with, Jai, I mean, you know, he, he, he got a budget. He looked at it, thought it was okay, and then he came and walked the building and thought it all matched up. He didn't back up. He just says, oh, you got one more than this. But he, he didn't say, my scope is off now. We need to, you know, he didn't, after he saw it, he didn't right. up his budget. He thought, okay, this scope yeah. is accurate. You validated the scope that was given. Yeah, and, 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 right. and he still he still stood by it after he came to saw the place. So. Yeah, there were a number of items that uh, prices came from him were very close in yeah. my mind because he understood exactly the scopes we talked about were similar. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, I, I would want a much more larger scope in that building. And my, kind of what I'm looking at just playing with right now is the fact that it's going to cost a lot to do Schlater the way we want to do it. It's like, wow, what if we took 
you know, less than this, <clears throat> what could we, we're looking at 15 to 20 million, uh, just, just rough numbers here, you know, much later, you know, that estimated numbers here, geez, what to do with 11? Uh, Eugene, so. we, we've never really had a discussion one. Exactly. Exactly. Like. exactly. We have, but I, I'm just putting <clears throat> here, you know, so yeah. I, I, that's, that's, that's part of the going here. <clears throat> And you're not here to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> you don't know that. We're just kind of, you know, we're just definitely here. So. Well, like we've all said before, one of the major things about the Eugene Field is the size of the school's wealthy. 500 kids in between two busy streets and yeah. in a 90 year old building. It's just, it's not it's not what's best for kids or for teachers who are, who are teaching the kids. Yeah. You know, it's just not, it's, it's, it's had its life as far as I'm concerned. Well, another thing we have here to talk about at all when we did our uh, study for security across the district, that building is identified as the number one issue regarding security issues as well, which we haven't really talked about at all in remediation. Yeah. yeah. And especially with the thought of knowing that <coughs> Mr. Pfeiffer's budget might be low for the scope that we think is necessary for that school today. You know, if you double that, you're putting eight or nine million into an old building that's not going to last for another fifty years. So I don't, I don't know about that. Is there, is there a way? Is there a way to evaluate if, if if a foundation was we we don't know this information yet, but is there an affordable way to evaluate a foundation and say, "Well, oh, my geez, old guys, ninety years ago, and then I put some concrete down, it's in great shape." Is it? You know, is there a drywall? I mean, is there a way to to evaluate the, the bones of, of both of these things? Yeah, but at the same time, if you're gonna if you're gonna spend eight or nine million to refurbish a building. To me, that doesn't make any sense if you're, you can build a new one for 12. I don't see that. I got 15, 20. Well, well, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it all depends on our scope. It depends on our scope. I don't want to settle this right now, but I, I think I think evaluating it a little bit more is some So even more. if you evaluate it, though, you're still not addressing the square footage per child. You're not addressing the busy streets. You're not yeah. addressing any of the safety concerns when it comes to the safety well, of the school. I mean, yeah, so you're right. Those are all things that are not talked about either. But sure. Those are the things that has been our number one goal for why we get these kids out of Eugene Field, yeah. to have a better structure for learning, to have a safer structure, mm -hmm. you know, and to get away from that busy street and to not be right downtown. I think that's, you know, where our focus has been. Yeah. And, you know, to me, building is, you know, <laughs> I just don't see it as a long-term solution and the best yeah. solution for the kids now. Yeah, I'm addressing playground issues, they green space, work. any of that. Well, I mean, I'm just in to give, like I said, not to, but there was some talk about closing that street off and getting some inside parking and fencing. And using that, there's, there's that grass lot that's basically, because as I understand it, it's just a place that the neighbors take their dogs out to poop. You know, close that off. That could be your, you know, there's, there is some but potential you, for a so small amount of money. But also, if you close that street off, where do the buses drop the kids off? You know, there's, you know, there is, I'm not, there's just a lot of, there's yeah. a lot of issues. Oh, there is, and there's issues, there's earthquake issues in, in many of our buildings. Mm -hmm. um, you creep 100 feet from the front door, is a 65, they're driving 60 miles an hour past that. It's a state highway going 60 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have these uh, um, Central Howell, it's a busy intersection. That it's these issues are everywhere, and we and we deal with them. And I, I I'm not I'm not married to, to, to the Eugene Field site, but if there is a substantial if if there is a substantial cost savings to just thoroughly you know fixing up the building, it, it bears merit and it bears, it bears further discussion. That's so all I'm saying. It sounds like you're out here is doing a, a formal feasibility program study. You know, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe on maybe on both options. Yeah, I mean, because I, I, you know, if if, if, if we're worried about an old building and the unknowns that Eugene Field, we're dealing with a lot of unknowns because of old structures of slavery. That that logic has to hold on both sites. I don't hear a lot of. Um, I mean, for myself, I should say I don't. I don't have a lot of issues with unknowns as far as what we're dealing with Eugene Field. For me, it's what we're what, what we already know yeah. that is driving my decision. The unknowns can only make it worse, in my opinion. You know, um, and with what we know alone, it seems like for me, it's enough. I'm kind of wondering too if we're talking about adding more capacity, you need to build more additional structures there. I don't know how we're going to meet you know, things like our parking codes, uh, you know, number of spaces required per um, 
things like that. I, I don't know how we would, you know, even even begin to meet those codes. And so I think we're looking at trying to get exceptions or waivers. Or, you know, that's just one one additional problem. But um, I don't know if we'd be allowed to build in additional uh, space there. Even if we continue to use Eugene Field, adding additional space there would be the wrong thing to do. If we have to add additional space, we can do it at Robert's or Oscar. Yeah. yeah, no, you wouldn't want to add any more, but it, it kind of goes to a bit of a, something I've been wondering. We're, we're doing this visioning process right now, and how how big do we want our in-town buildings to get? We're, I think most of our enrollment growth is coming from in-town. Do we just keep getting more population in our buildings? If, if, we, if we see in 15, 20 years we're going to need more space, maybe we sh should be thinking a little bit um, strategically about how that's going to go, or are we just going to keep expanding these buildings, and then we're going to have these thousand students buildings that people seem to not like in Salem, but they're going to leave. I, 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 just, I sometimes think maybe we need to complete our visioning process, and maybe that'll help us answer those questions, and that'll help us determine our, our what we want for whatever we do with the Eugene Field issue. You know, um, I just I, I I one of the one of the one of the critics. One of the, the, the criticisms I heard during the last bond was that they didn't know how the money was going to be spent, and people were telling me that, that what's your vision? Define your vision, and let's apply the money to the vision. They didn't know what the vision was. And right now, we're, it seems like we've got the cart in front of the horse. We need to finish the visioning process first, and then help us define what we really want to operate this district you know, in the future, 20, 30 years. And, than apply the money to that vision. I think we're, I I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're getting a car in front of the horse here. Uh, can I go, just, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily yeah. agree with that, Tom. Okay. One of the things that we've heard from the, during the visioning process is people like our district the way it is. You know, people like the case, people like the choices of schools, people like all that. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't see a need to make any, any big changes in that for the, for the time being right now. Just a couple other thoughts on, you talked about doing more studies on Eugene Field. I don't know how much more we can do. Well, we've had, no, let me finish. Let me finish, finish with some more thoughts. We've had a lot, many studies done on Eugene Field. Over and over, we've heard the same thing. The building has seen its useful life. They reckon, we've been recommended many times to get out of that building. I don't know how many more studies we need or how much more we can really hash, hash it over, to be honest. I think I think a decision needs to be made. My my opinion. I just don't I just don't know what else we're going to stay. The building is 92 years old. Plus, you also brought up the fact that we have a lot of needs in this district. You know, Butte Creek. Of course, there's seismic needs in the lunch in the cafeteria out there. Um, Central House, Scotts Mills. There are there are needs, but with the budgets we have, we can't address everything at the same time. Um, in my mind, Eugene Field is one of our highest needs. It is. So we take we try to take care of the highest needs, and then we chip away at the other ones. We have other we have other sources of revenue from um, oh, what's the name of the 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 construction excise tax and things like that. Yeah. Where maybe we can take some of that money and put it to start working on the Butte Creek problem or the Central Howl. You know, we got it. We've got to address the highest needs, and we've got to start chipping away at the other things as we can. Yes, I and I think Eugene Field is the highest needs, and frankly, I don't know what else we're going to what else we're going to find if we study other than other than what Owen said, more more problems. Because usually, in my in my experience, whenever you go to remodel something, you always end up with more problems than you start with. Agree. You always end up with more problems and more costs, and it's always a bigger budget. So, just find your sense. And, and Tim, I agree, and that's, and that's, that's the thing that got me work, and I agree, if you get into Eugene Field, there's going to be more than what we're, we're looking at. But I'm, th I'm saying that that same logic probably also applies to Schlater. You're going to find more than you know, and that's and the cost is going to go up. And, and I'm afraid that we're going to cut. We're going to have to cut elsewhere. It's just going to be a, if it's going to be not a very nice project when it's done, and, 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 I, I, I don't want to argue. I just don't, it's just been something that's been on my mind in the past couple days. I've been fleshing things out a lot, and I, 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 I don't. I just think it yeah. deserves a little bit of well, credit. Uh, earlier, we ended up there. We need to establish what the scope's going to be. Yes. We had yes. to talk about yeah. yes. what the place will look like. Only yes. yes. Which, which brings us to let's try to wrap up this this part of it. 
the part of the, the remediation budget and what Bob was talking about here before we kind of We can talk about this. So are there more questions to Bob or more comments on the whole remediation budget thing that Mr. Pfeiffer brought, brought forward? So your, your, your final analysis here in rough terms is that um, realistically it's about twice what Mr. Pfeiffer suggested. Um, actually, I would say it's more than that because what I did it was sort of apples for apples. If I refer back to um, the document you received on a major renovation of Eugene Field from the field of the architects, it was 10.6 million. Um, I think that was a little more inclusive, again, because what I did was kind of comparing the budget items that Mr. Pfeiffer had and kind of dragged them over. I think there's some items there that weren't ne necessarily included. So I, I would say that it's actually um, two and a half times. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Okay, Andy, would you like to move us on to the next part? I will. Thank you. You have a copy or sheet in front of you uh, at the top of the top. It's titled Reconfiguring Options for Slater Campus Conversion to a Middle School. Uh, this is not a new topic. This topic has been addressed uh, uh, multiple times in the past. I think some of you on the board may have heard some similar information, but this is 2014, and uh, I think the latest review of, of this information, and it's an extension of the request that you asked me at the Mark meeting to uh, uh, come up with some uh, at least consideration for what it could look like. So just as you go down the list, uh, this again is not that does not contain de detail uh, uh, specific to to scope, say for instance, or or what it could look like, uh, could look like from a, a building specific standpoint. But it does take into account some assumptions, which you have to do. And I, I, actually, before I even talk about the assumptions, the other piece is that when you when you talk about schools, and you even talk about schools, everything from enrollment, uh, use, programming, even from year to year, many of those variables change. So so I, I'd like you to keep in mind that these assumptions and this information is reflective of a snapshot in time. Right now, uh, we don't know if our enrollment is going to jump by 2% next year, or half a percent, or go down half a percent. We don't know. Uh, or what it'll look like five or 10 years from now. But the snapshot in time, I think, is our best estimate of what things could look like. So the assumptions are discontinued use of Eugene Field School uh, if we were to move to the Schlater campus. Uh, full day kindergarten. 25 students per classroom in all grades, uh, excluding special programs. Uh, uh, maintenance of current program, that means uh, maintaining what we have in the district at this time. I listed a number of examples there uh, at Eugene uh, Field School. Uh, and also uh, a co-placement of community roots charter school on the Schlater campus. I put that in there more than anything just as a reminder that in all the conversations we've had at this point, whether we convert it to a middle school or pick up Eugene Field and put it on the Schlater campus, the conversation to this point and that has occurred also by your task force is that uh, Community Roots Charter School could be located, could be co-located uh, with uh, uh, a change of use of the Slater campus, uh, which is one of the recommendations. So let's just talk some numbers as we go down the sheet. Uh, you'll have to get a reference and follow with me. The current school enrollment for Eugene Field is as of uh, the first of the month is 456. Uh, in Eugene Fields. Uh, if we went fully kindergarten, that would jump uh, another 60 plus students, so I put 520 in there uh, as a likely option. Keep in mind as well, the enrollment to Eugene Field has uh, dropped over the last few years somewhat, uh, and part of that drop has been uh, due to transfers out to other schools in the district or other districts for a variety of reasons. Robert Frost School is currently 431 students. Mark Twain School is currently 307 students. Here. Current enrollment is 1194 in those uh, uh, nine grades, K through eight, or 1258 if it had full day humor. Just taking Eugene Field out of the picture, uh, with the unknown about what Slater could look like, Mark Twain capacity as an elementary school, not as a middle school, but as an elementary school, is 350 students. Again, give or take, that's a fluid number, and it is reflective of programming and, and a number of uh, other variables, but we believe that to be accurate at this point. Whereas the middle school, more realistically, it's about 325 students at the Department of Life Study Middle School. Rob Frost uh, building capacity is about 450 students, and again, that's somewhat fluid based on programming needs of school. So we have total seats available, about 800, without consideration of the Schlater campus. So moving uh, conversion of Schlater to a middle school campus with the two options that I listed there, if you were to uh, make a 7-8 campus, which I know was discussed last time, if you begin at the 7-8 campus and move backwards, 
through our frosty through Mark 20, you take the 1258, which is the enrollment of uh, uh, the kindergarten, minus 307, which would be the grade 70 for Mark 20, you have uh, 951 uh, students left to find a home for. And the total uh, capacity of uh, Mark 20 and Robert Frost is 800 students. So converting to Slater campus is 7 8, while it's an option. Uh, you, know, you don't have room, enough room in the current structures in order to provide seats for the remaining students. Mark Twain's grades could be 5 6 enrollment, uh, it would be about 288, so you'd be able to get your grades 5 6 in there. Uh, and if you were to throw another grade in there, 288 was about 140. Uh, you're uh, over 400 students, so you'd be over the capacity of 350 Mark Twain. Robert Frost, uh, if it were to become K-4 at that time, would be 664 students, so Robert Frost capacity is 450 students. Uh, that doesn't include the, the you know, creative potential to be device in classrooms or add classrooms to the covered play area, et cetera. Yeah, and how much, if we were adding another pod there, how many additional kids could that hold? Uh, if you were to add a pod, that would need six classrooms, assuming that it's possible, we're going to look into that, Wally, but that, that would that would handle 150 kids. So uh, again, we're getting the Schlater campus and moving backwards. We're going to make the Schlater campus the very 678 campus, which is a very traditional model for a firm middle school, a very common. Take the 1258 again, minus the 450 students. Um, uh, which, which is what we would have at the Slater campus. You would have 800 students remaining uh, to split between Mark Twain and Robert Frost campuses. Mark Twain grades would be four or five, so again, 288 students would fit there, you have a little bit of room. And Robert Frost grades K3 would be 520. Uh, and again, the Robert Frost capacity is 450 students. So you have a more realistic option to fit Robert, excuse me, to use both Mark Twain and Robert Frost campuses if you were to convert, in my mind, anyway, in my opinion, uh, the, the Schlater into a 6, 7, 8 campus. That's, that's much more palatable than just picking up and moving the Mark Twain kids to the high school in the current model of 7, 8. So with that said, I, I asked uh, Bob uh, to take a look at what scenarios could be not only converted Schlater into uh, a, a grade 7, 8 or 6, 7, 8 campus, but also consider, it, consider Robert Frost the current building of Robert Frost, also considered potential use of Robert Frost property, and also uh, potential upgrades to Mark Twain, uh, and even consideration of use of the steel hammer property, as you discussed that last time. It's currently for sale, but it's owned by you, and, and sure it could be used for a school if that's what you chose to do. Uh, keep in mind as well that uh, these are all estimates. Uh, um, Bob used uh, ranges in there rather than specifics if you don't have the exact scope. Uh, probably more than anything, you've done the most work on the Schlater Street campus over the last few years simply because you dived into that campus quite a bit and you've had a couple of evaluations on that campus actually over the last 10 years uh, that I think are still valid today in many ways from, from, a, from a scope determination standpoint. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bob uh, to help address what these look like. I have one quick question. Yeah, one of the assumptions was that the co placement of community roads, when we talked about that, that wasn't a, agreed on. I didn't understand that we had agreed that that. So if they were not in that building, does that really change all of this as well? Uh, because I'm not saying it wouldn't be, and that we still need to work with them for sure. That's not what right. I'm saying. But this is with the calculation that they would still be in the Slater Street campus. Right. My, my estimation, Julie, is that Community Root School will need to continue on the Slater campus one way or another, unless they find a home somewhere that they haven't found yet. And I had this conversation as to Tim with their board and, and the leadership as well. And whether whether they continue their current placements using a few classrooms of the city's sort of portion on James or whether some uh, conversion of Shelley Street campus happens occurs. My point with that bullet is, I think Shelley is going to be home, in my opinion, of community room school, whether it takes with the current model or whether we repurpose the Shelley. Uh, they just want to get room on for the community room school. How many students does community roots have? We currently have 80, uh, three students, I believe, with capacity to 90. Uh, there's been some talk about that potentially increasing, which would be an actual request over time. Do they have, is there, do they have a vision of how big they'd like to get? And is there room for them? You know, do they want to get to, you know, are they seeing, hey, we'd like to 120? 
we need more room to do they have any indication of that? They, they do. Uh, they, uh, there's been no pinpoint number, Tom, but uh, I, I think to, to make an, an equation to Bethany Charter School for the purposes of no other, nothing other than enrollment, they, I, I believe their board, and the board members here tonight, but I believe their board would likely say, that seems a reasonable expectation of about 135 students at some point in the future. And no doubt they have aspirations to maybe even go higher, but realistically, it's ultimately up to you and up to us as a district to say yes or no to that. I, I, I guess what I'm getting at, it, it sounds like they would, you know, it's reasonable to expect that they would like to expand, but is there room for them to then expand? Is that a good site for them going forward? Uh, you could, it would have to be part of the scope of work, but yeah. using the current facility, yes, uh, there you go. discounting the multi-story portion, if you were to, to uh, okay, replace that, uh, there is sufficient room on there for a six, seven, eight middle school and community research school. Yes. Yeah. 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 They, they, they express, right now, K6, they express the desire to eventually get to K8. Okay. And I think they, is it about 120 that they, the number they talked about? Yeah, yeah that I mean, they're not sure. They're yet. not sure. Right. 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 They just one, thing we, one thing we did request of them is to um, just start thinking about their needs. Yeah. And yeah. They, as we get, as we get, you know, as we move through this process, start thinking about their needs. So yeah. when we, you know, when we start working with them, yeah. they, they'll. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I guess I mean that just because I, I think we all, we, we, oh, yeah. we don't want to inadvertently pigeonhole. Yeah. You know, yeah. So. Okay. Good. Bob. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, um, go over the uh, scenario one a bit. Uh, you noticed there that it refers to note number one, which is most of the information came from. Um, the Dow estimate that was done after the May bond um, was defeated, and kind of some work that was put there and see how it could possibly be elementary school. I was kind of talk a little bit about the item there. Site traffic costs, uh, we know that whatever goes there on a new uh, remodel it has to be a change to Slater Street and Brown Street, I believe it is. Is that right? Go there. Go there. Yeah, yeah, it's Brown Street. And uh, so that would that part of that. There's also kind of, uh, water lines, sewer lines that we know would have to change in conversation that we had before. So that, that was a it was a study that was done um, from the consultant that Dow had to take a look at the site traffic cost of that that uh, site. Whether it was middle school or elementary school, it would still be the same. So the remodel cost again that would be taking. The classrooms on the James Street side and the other uh, closer to the district office, and uh, putting in appropriate heating systems and uh, other uh, um, items in there that would bring it up to more current standards. There is a range there, and that may even be a little high. Again, that's a scope that, that needs to be defined. You know, is it, do you just put heat in and put a paint job on, or do you really upgrade all the finishes? That's something that. Um, and their assessment was probably a higher end, but that's something certainly that we can have a conversation about. Uh, new construction, um, that actually uh, is based on the 600 students, and uh, I believe that was based on a square foot of cost of about $250 square foot, you know, for the number of students, and it's like 120 square feet per student. So again, this is just a range cost. Um, Develop costs, design fees, and um, permits management, insurance, and all those things that you know, go into the development cost for a project. So um, the range here is 15.75 to 20.5 uh, million, and um, that's pretty much come about the work that was done by Dow previously, and some of their consultants. That's how we came up with those figures there. So my assumption of these numbers, at the end of the day, we have a modern looking elementary school one of the patched together. That's right. So yeah, there, there would be about 30,000 square feet of new construction in the centerpiece, single story, I call it a two story, I believe, in the library area, is how it was. You know, and the finishes on the outside would be changed, the entrance would be new, you know, and landscaping and all that. And the paving would be done. There's going to be bus parking going around, you know, between the district office and, you know, with a lot of similarities to the middle school design, you know, as far as how traffic would flow. So could it be, I think it could be done cheaper, but it may not look like a, it look like a cheap. <laughs> so the <laughs> so so way the person that brand new facility is meant to be there. Yeah, you can sort of make the exterior have some 
were major changes than maybe some of the interior finishes, you know, and keep the more classic buildings inside. So, uh, any other comments or questions about that scenario? Okay. So, Andy talked about scenario two, where you would actually move the Eugeneville students um, over to Robert Frost, and so I'll talk about that column here. Um, site costs there, uh, there will be some work involved in actually putting in that six classroom underneath the cover play area. Um, and there's also, you know, talk about the fact that a dining room or a kitchen facility would need to be added to that site to accommodate the students. I think right now it's, it's a non-ideal situation. So that the site costs there to take into account what upgrades need to be done there. Uh, there is some seismic work, although if that would actually occur, we could put classroom under the cover play area, it would be mitigated largely because the new structure would solve a lot of the problems with the cover play area being suspended you know, over the uh, poles there. Uh, remodel work, uh, and, you know, that's largely the, um, the work that's going to be taken. I call it remodel work for the, for the new pod structures because it's sort of going in underneath of the existing building. You, know, you have uh, uh, essentially a roof structure already there. You, you know, obviously you've got to take up the asphalt. And I uh, mentioned here one to two million. Again, it's largely scope that has to be defined. Um, and then uh, that also include a new cover play area since we're going to be losing one there if we go that route. And so, um, and then there was also again the, the number four was constructed in the cafeteria. So that's. That's all in the uh, new construction and the remodel cost. Uh, development cost again would be you know site design, architectural fees, and management. So the uh, the range of costs there would be uh, 3.15 to 5.57. Uh, and that event, so then the um, um, students at Robert Frost would move to Mark Twain, and if you take a look there, the first uh, cost. Uh, size like one and a quarter to 1.75 million. That's pretty much figures right out of the ZCS report, um, which identifies that it's the old part of the building that needs to have the majority of the work done. Uh, the window, the diaphragm along the walls, is also the roof structure, which has some issues because it's a stepped construction and there's some, uh, some real design work to how to achieve seismic stability there. Um, the remodel work. We'll take into account windows that are not replaced during the seismic work. Some of the window panels would actually be uh, filled in with uh, structural panels, but the remaining ones would be new windows going in. There's uh, carpet and some roofing would still want to go on. Things are identified in uh, previous um, remodel budgets. Um, there's also some new plumbing and heating system in there. The, the uh, unit uh, heaters in each room are pretty old and failing. Uh, new construction there um, is a, um, a new play, play area. Again, it's, again, using figures we developed in the uh, budget from the last bond, and um, you know, size is just assumed. There's no real scope that's developed for that. Development costs, there would be some additional design work uh, that has to happen for the additional roofing, windows going in, and any remodel work that's happening. Um, and so the total for the uh, upgrades of Mark Twain under that scenario would be 2.45 to 3.3. Again, these are just some large assumptions on, on the scope of work. And then the final... Um, uh, I got a question on, on the slave question there. Um, it doesn't look like you included the site traffic costs for the Schlater. For Schlater or Mark Twain? For the Durham City Area number three, correct? No, I haven't gotten scenario number one. Okay. okay. I'm going back to the Schlater in scenario number two. Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. <coughs> okay. Um, so the, uh, the the cost of the Schlater Street, they're, they're largely the same scope as the, uh, uh, the item above. There are fewer students. So um, what's really different there is that the um, the new construction is different. There's going to be less new construction that's needed. Um, otherwise, you know, everything else is pretty much the same as far as site costs, remodeling of the existing portions of the building, and development costs. Um, so the price tag on that was 13, 
16.75 to 16.75. So if you actually were to do work in all three of those uh, facilities, all the way over to the right, the uh, range is 19.35 to 25.62 million. Bob, the, the, the numbers on Schlater for both of those, that include demolition of the yeah. Yeah. part? And, and abatement. Oh, it did? Okay. Yes. Demolition of the two story and three stories. As well as the shop and the barn that's in the, sort of the center of the uh, oh. asphalt area in back. Okay. Yeah. okay. So um, going on to scenario three, if Eugene Field students were to move to a new structure on the lower portion of the Robert Frost property, um, <coughs> we have here um, the site cost um, 2.5 to 3.5, and the notes uh, talk about the fact that, you know, I took a look at where the current utilities are for that site, had a conversation with the city, um, and without any clear scope and size, exact whether or not we could actually connect to the nearest point is up for a decision. But assuming that, um, and I worked with uh, with uh, Irv here on some site costs. He went out there, took a look at some stuff, so we could kind of get some real rough ballpark uh, ideas at that property. One of the things it mentions here, uh, number eight. Currently, there's a short section of road that's in between Robert Frost and the retirement facility. And the city said that they're right away going down there, and they would actually uh, want to they want to see a road go all the way down to uh, lead to a new entrance to that uh, school that would be built, and that there would be pretty significant SDC credits should that occur, because it's actually on their would be on their land that would be need to be built for that property to be used. So, uh, so in that uh, the site cost. Uh, that includes, you know, the uh, having the pad built and the foundation, as well as doing utility work and putting in that road. I think we figured about a thousand feet of road or so, if I remember correctly. Uh, so then, uh, new construction for that we figured I figured about fourteen point five to seventeen point five million. It's a pretty big range, but part, there's two reasons for that. One is. Uh, because it's a pretty sloped site, it may be best to actually, instead of trying to create a level building pads, actually it creates one of the stepped design. Um, just, you know, and doing that is going to be a little bit of additional cost for how it's designed and built, but it'll be less site cost. So there's a definite range of costs there depending on how uh, the district wanted to do that and how architects all and engineer how that can be built. And then um, Development costs there again would be um, design, uh, management, all the fees, and insurance, and all that stuff that goes along with the project of that size. So that the range of that project there would be 20 million to 25 million. And in that same uh, row, stepping back, there would still be, I believe, uh, an interest to to demolish that uh, the Schlager Street part of the of the. Uh, two and three story part of the building to get rid of as far as the risk, but that's something that was an assumption on my part, so. I think you had a question, Wally, well, about? No, I got, I got, I understand. Um, so down to the final scenario where the Eugene Field students were to move to steel hammer property. Um, essentially, the construction is pretty much the same, figuring the same kind of footprint, um, and the development costs are basically the same, you know, figuring the same kind of uh, um, school and, and all the design fees. What's different there, and what's an unknown if you were to actually consider that, is that that road is not really wide enough to be able to handle traffic on up there, so you'd actually have to, the city would have to buy a bunch of right away land and you know, improve the road all the way down to Oak Street, and probably include some improvements to Oak Street intersection there. It, it, uh, it's probably possible, but it's not. You know, there's nothing that's uh, uh, verified with the city that you know what would have to take to do that. Uh, and again, there's also an assumption to be able to hook the utilities. There are there is water and sewer in Steel Hammer and also behind the property. Um, don't know for sure the size of the utilities there. And you know, I think I think they it would be fine. But if they if they weren't right enough size, uh, I did actually uh, work out with, with their 
what it would take to actually upgrade the utilities all the way down to Oak Street. I think that's something we should figure in and something that would be part of the project budget we're looking at at this point. And uh, so you add those two together, that would be um, 21.4 million to 27.4 million as a, as a range. Okay, any other questions? Questions from Bob? This is very good information. <coughs> the question I, I came up with and it kind of touches back again to, uh, to the remediation issue, but it, it really it, it is uh, relevant to all of us. But, I was thinking in, in the housing construction that I've been involved with for the last 10 years, I would say we're probably just by code maybe 30% more efficient today in terms of our operational efficiency on a house uh, than we were 10 years ago, just by virtue of, you know, every two years we've got a new set of code that uh, has more you know, requirements. And I'm wondering, um, you know, our operational expense of these buildings, um, you know, what, what differences we might be looking at, say, and, and whether or not there was uh, energy efficiency uh, budget built into the Eugene Field project. You know, we've got some upgraded windows there already, uh, and I think masonry construction is inherently pretty efficient, but um, I don't know if you can comment on some of that, what we might be looking at in terms of a new school versus some of these other... Well, yeah, it would, to put in the same kind of R value and U value in a new building compared to a remodel building is certainly less expensive per square foot, um, just for labor costs. And uh, sometimes it's hard to achieve that kind of R value, even at, at the Schlater campus, for example, in those 1950s uh, um, classrooms. To be able to get that kind of R value, you know, R22, you'd have to build new walls in front of it, and that's you know, kind of makes it really blows the budget up. So you probably would never be able to get the kind of efficiency in those structures that you could in, in a new building without spending a lot of money. You probably do some new windows would help. You know, um, putting in a drop ceiling with insulation is not a real expensive way of getting since most heat is lost through the roof, but um, certainly. Uh, it'd be a lot more expensive to try to make them as, as energy efficient as you build them, as well as the new equipment, camera equipment. In my understanding, too, is there some state code requirement or some state law requirement for our public buildings here that we have to spend a certain amount of money, a certain percentage of our budget, actually, on energy efficiency measures, I think, isn't there? Like 2 or 3% or something like that. Yes. The budget. Yes. So. Yeah. Is there, would the, would the new building have air conditioning in it? That's up for you to decide. This well, I, the reason I asked that, I remember seeing a couple of years ago, Andy. Maybe maybe you can recall this question, but we had there was a comparison sheet about the power bills at Slater, the old Slater when it was a high school, and and the new campus here. And the power bills here were 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 marked were dramatically higher, and it was because of air conditioning and, and all the new goodies, and people used it a lot more. It wasn't. It's like buying a new car. You got you're going to drive it. Everyone's going to say, "Just let's let's drive your new car with the air conditioning turned on." It was granted that the individual systems were much more efficient, but there was much more. And I think that was the reason that you know that the power bills at this building are more than Schlater. And I believe that's in a time when natural gas prices have been decreasing. So I, I don't I don't want to get rocks and garbage throwing me because I'm I'm skeptic here tonight, but I. I I just, you know, if that's a kid, I, I don't want to make a false argument and tell people that we're going to save money on power bills if we're not. But if you're right, the, 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 if I remember correctly, the power bills were significantly higher than yeah. all the other utilities were down. Yeah, yeah, this is beautiful. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, so it's... Water and gas, water and gas, power, here. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's I, absolutely, absolutely. And I just don't want to, you know, I remember, remember hearing our, uh, Pete, our old <clears throat> um, uh, maintenance guy says, Eugene Fields a good, cheap run bill. That was just an offhand comment. I believe I heard. I could be wrong about that. Maybe it isn't. But it just, you know, so I don't want to. I, I don't want to sell people on. Sell, I want to sell them on facts, not, not you know, not assumptions. Well, and that's where the scope comes in. Yes. You know, it probably was quite warm in there on some days and yes. maybe cold on some days. And here you have a much more controlled environment. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's a beautiful school. But closing Eugene Field does have a benefit that we haven't talked about too, and that is that you have one less property. And we can yeah. invest ourselves in that property, whereas if you um, 
continued there, I don't see us divesting of the right. street property you know, down the road. So right, there's, there's, a, sure there's a background energy cost that constantly with lights and things, and yeah, we, we eliminate that. Additional property that we yeah. maintain, yeah. et cetera. But, yeah. Revenue for the tax base projects. Yeah. Revenue. Right. Yeah. Other questions for Bob? Bob, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank Steel hammer probably isn't a very good option because we make a bunch of enemies by, by expanding Steel Hammer Road. Um, and uh, the difference between two and three, the advantage of two over three is just that uh, we'd be able to get the junior high kids over Schlater versus an elementary grade. Okay. Yeah. And the cheapest is just to move over The cheapest is just to move Eugene kids over to over Schlater. Yeah. Yeah. And the advantage of that, it's easy to explain. The advantage of that, with scenario number one also, it's, it's easy to explain. Yes. It's not, not complicated at all. But does that take care of the um, number one? Does that take care of the seismic um, at New Creek? Or, um, not, none of these do. No. no. Well, yeah, they do. Not New Creek. Not New Creek, but. Um, Eugene, fit Bob, you, yeah. Needs to clarify that. So, first question. Um, if you move the Eugene Field students, um, Robert Frost, part of that would be taken care of because yeah, you would have to remodel that. Oh, the playground. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And also Mark Twain. Yeah, so I mean. <clears throat> you'd have the seismic yeah. part of Mark Twain taken care of. Yeah, the, the upshot of scenario two is that you have three schools that have been addressed and have been modernized to some degree. I mean, obviously you're not going to touch every portion of Robert Frost or Mark Twain, but, but the three schools will be, have been improved. That's a point. It just depends on how much we want to spend or, you know, what size of a bond we want to build. How much, how much we have the courage to ask for. <laughs> not yeah. willing. The how willing are to pony up. Yeah. 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 Those are the yeah. issues. It's interesting to me that scenario two, that you know, 20 to 25 million, it's still uh, quite a bit less expensive than the last bond we were going to go for. Or the last bond we put up. This is a smaller building. That's part of, part of the reason. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, one less grade. <clears throat> Just thoughts on the advantages or disadvantages of um, Schlater being a K3 versus a 678. Anybody have thoughts on that? I'm just trying to stimulate a little discussion here. <laughs> like you need any. <laughs> it's just cheaper. Yeah, it's cheaper. I mean, it, 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 some people's point is cheaper. Um, I know there has been talk, of, we've had, had a talk before that Schrader might be better suited for junior high because of the, the, the ball fields, the sports fields, the all that stuff, the high school kids coming over. So that's. I think it is, but I think it's workable. We might want, we might, yeah, yeah. We might want to talk about adding some fencing to have a very clear uh, line of demarcation between the, mm -hmm. the, where the high school kids and the elementary kids are. Mm -hmm. There also might be some, I've also heard that there might be some advantages there too with the high school kids being able to go to Eugene Field and help, help out. Like a lot of some of them are just quite close. I have one question with the Robert Frost. The remodel, or the remodel Robert Cross, um, was there any, and then you may be better to ask this one, because I've heard some of the teachers 
the open classroom design up there. I've heard some of the teachers talking about how that isn't ideal because of the noise. Um, and I can imagine that may even be worse if it's a K-3. Is there any, is there any way to remedy that or to close those classrooms up? Or I take it none of that would be included in this. None of that is included in this team. I mean, it, it, everything costs money, of course. And uh, uh, I think uh, you know we have a design and a scope that was, that was established in 1969 or 70 when that school was constructed. and. And it's been the same since. I, I do uh, know that the accordion doors between each of the classrooms are essentially permanently closed. They they were open in the 70s, maybe even in the 80s, a little bit to allow for a little bit more of that open air uh, instruction, which was contemporary then. Uh, but those have remained permanently closed. And uh, I, I think the, the uh, uh, I think the school adapts and adapts well. The media center in the middle can be kind of noisy. Students on the mezzanine can be kind of noisy. But generally speaking, I think Robert Frost does a nice job of adapting to the needs of that building, regardless of what that scope is. And they make it work very well. I think you do the same with an elementary. I actually wouldn't recommend it because I'm not certain that change of that scope, or excuse me, change of the layout of that building uh, would be very well received by the community as well because it hasn't been identified really as a concern. Mm -hmm. Another thing with a little, little bit lower price tag of the of converting Schneider to to Eugene Field, you could. I mean, there's a possibility there of adding a little bit onto that to take care of some some of our, of our other size techniques, like a new crate for Mark Twain. If you were going to try to borrow that. And, and can I chime in right there a little bit, Tim? Because this may be helpful information. Uh, I, I have met uh, uh, with. Um, uh, Scott uh, and uh, Zach, uh, Scott Fuller and Zach Stokes, uh, Zach from TCS, about uh, uh, submitting a grant on behalf of the school district uh, to the, for the state seismic grant, uh, and that uh, using the using the scope work that uh, or, uh, that the evaluation that seismic complete, excuse me, that TCS completed for us on the seismic evaluation, that View Creek was really one of the most needed projects for seismic upgrades when it came to that cafeteria. Mark Twain, I think, is in a close second and actually may even be a, uh, an equal second depending upon who you speak to. But there is the potential there, and ZCS has nearly 100% success rate, and I, that's an accurate statement, of submitting grant applications on behalf of school, on behalf of school districts uh, and, and being selected. So if that rings true with us, and we're able to identify uh, uh, up to 1.5 million from the traditional amount. That 1.5 million would address the needs entirely uh, of new preschool, according to uh, ZCS. So we we're, we will be applying for that grant. Uh, it'll take a little while to, to understand whether we get the funds or not, uh, but that will be assessed. Second to that, I think this is really helpful for you to know, is uh, averaged over the last six years since you have begun implementation of your construction excise tax, the average revenue generated to the school district has been about $60,000 a year. Uh, and you're developing that, you're accruing it, you, you, you really have it, so you spend a little bit of it, not much of it. And I think when you think in terms of that, in terms of the revenue that you still have coming in from sale of Robert Frost property, that you still have coming in from the sale of, uh, not Robert Frost property, but the property adjacent to Robert Frost, and from a monitor school, and if you were able to sell a steel hammer property and other, any other surplus property that you have in the school district, you've got. A, a, a revenue stream coming in that could be relied upon to do exactly as you were talking about a little while ago, Tim, chip away at some of these even significant projects in this school district, yeah. including the gym at Central Howell and you know other projects that need to be addressed. Currently, your balance, counting the construction excise tax and the sale of, of, of property, is right around 1.5 million. Uh, you spent some of that. But we've had conversations about this, about the uncertainty of Eugene Field and not spending that down at this time. But I've asked Joel Smallwood to begin developing what could be a multi-year plan to be able to utilize that dollars, to, those dollars to help spend down, or excuse me, to help address uh, the, the needs in this district, especially, especially the roofing and the envelope needs of in this district to make these buildings sustain for years to come. And he's working on that. That's good. So you, you have some resources. Yeah. If a bond doesn't pass, however, <laughs> if you choose not to put a bond on the ballot, or, or if you do, excuse me, and it doesn't pass, or if you choose not to, then uh, again, I'm going to lean back on the board and say, how do you want to use that 1.5 million to take care of the needs of you Field Field School? Yeah. 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 Just as a thought, oftentimes when I look at these things, you know, I think of the political thing of 
all the money on the bond, you know, voters, Mr. Voter, Mr. Mrs. Voter, a lot of them, a lot of them, us who voters who they don't really pay attention to things until the time until it's right. close. They're going to open that up and they're going to see all the money's going to the in-town schools mm -hmm. and the role they're going to vote no. So it might, if you can, spend some of that money in town and then bond some of the money for like a deep creek or a rural issue just to give, just to, you know, remind, even though we all know it all works out the same, just make sure that things are, you know, on the bond is saying deep creek rural schools and things like that just to remind, just to, just to help, help out with that district. Well, I also think we talk about, <clears throat> if we were to go for a bond to replace the aging field, if we talk about our other revenue sources and talk about things we're going to start trying to chip away at. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've already started with chipping away at some of the technology issues and yeah. some things like that. So I think if we just start doing that. And I, on the last one go around, I heard from quite a few people in the, in the rural school, outline schools about they understood the need to do something with Eugene Field. They haven't totally understood that. Yep. So, so um, Yeah, and no, I haven't heard really from anybody. I haven't heard a soul who says, oh, Eugene Field's fine, don't do that. There needs to be something like that. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that. Either. Other comments or discussion on this part of our... Well, just another comment. If we decide to go with scenario one, I don't, we haven't made a decision here yet, but if we do, I think we need to go to the next step and, and just have a little discussion about what the scope look like. I think we need to decide that's what we want to do first. Yes. Yeah. But, but uh, these are pretty large, rock, rock, mm -hmm. large range numbers. Purposely, because we don't have a mm -hmm. scope, do, scope document, so we need to figure yeah. that out. Yes. Anything else before we move on to the Eugene Field Task Force recommendations? Andy, did you have anything on this? What is that? The Task Force recommendations. Part of why, what I kind of wanted to talk about this tonight was one that there were parts of this we um, we want to we want to adopt. I was hoping to, you know, like I said before, I was hoping to make a decision on on whether to get out of Eugene Field or not in April, but because the the district-wide newsletter just went out this last week, and that gets, we gave, told people we give them a couple weeks to respond to that. I think it might be better to wait until that time frame is up before we, before we, you know, move ahead with the voting on this. Just, if we already, you know, people might say, well, you voted and already made a decision, we haven't even had a long time to send you gifts. So, you know, in my opinion, I would like to, I would like to make a decision on that in May. I think we'd really need to move ahead if we're going to, especially if we're going to go for a bond. But are there parts of this that, I mean, there might be some parts we want to vote on in the next meeting, or we wait to do it all in May, or just discussion? I think we should wait until the uh, public input period is closed. For the whole thing. Before yes, we do it. I think it's got to be okay. yeah. um, And once we make a decision one way or another, Assuming we, we move ahead with, with one of these options, um, there's going to be a little bit more work after we make that decision to, to develop the scope and come up the cost. And when is a drop dead for determining all of that to get a dollar number and a, and a definition of scope into the elections? Uh, the, uh, the, the resolution is required to be approved uh, 61 days prior to the election. Uh, Wally, so it would be uh, September. Yeah, in September. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Any other discussion on any parts of the task force recommendations? I think this is something we can um, spend some time talking about at our next work session in April. And I know at the last at the last meeting, you know, we had, we had talked about. Getting out of Eugene Field, but there was some um, some issues around setting the time. So, but I think that's something you would, as you know, individually we could be thinking about, and what we kind of want to see out of this, and then talk about some of the a lot of this at our next work session, and possibly make a make a formal decision in there. Okay. Okay. Okay, that concludes our discussion items tonight. We're going to take a five minute break and. We'll come back and do an executive session of our RF 192. Once again, thank you very much thank you. for coming, everyone. Good to see you. Remember the next meeting for public comment next Monday.